Let's see, I got to tell you about one of the games we were playing right there in that Coliseum. We were getting ready for the biggest game of the year. There were 90,000 people in that stadium, and it was so loud. It felt like the stadium was vibrating. I mean, it was just shaking. We were walking down the tunnel. We had our helmets clicked up, gloves on. We were all the guys were together. It was game time, and it was the biggest game of the year because the team we were playing, they were undefeated. They ranked number one in the nation, but we had three losses. I wish I had come from an undefeated family, but some of us have families that have three, four, five losses. And you know what happened? All week on the ESPN, the experts had already predicted we was going to lose. But they didn't know what we had in here. So as we run out on the field, the first series of the game, quarterback comes up, looks around, the crowd is so loud you can't even hear. But we hype and he goes, Blue 18, Red 88, all the ball snaps. We explode off the ball. My man drops back. We're coming after him, but he sets up. And just like the experts have predicted all week, shoo, 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 up and down the field they go. They're scoring their wheel. We can't stop them. They're doing their little pretty boy dances in the end zone. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the worst first half I had ever played in. Everyone say this with me. Everybody say first half. First half. Second half. Second half. Never lie. First half. First half. Second half. Second half. By the end of that first half, we ran off that field. And the same 90,000 that were cheering so loud for us, they were making this sound as we ran into the tunnel. Boo. You know, because L.A. folks, y'all real fickle, fickle, fickle. <laughs> You ain't winning, I ain't got no time for you. <laughs> you go down to Alabama, they show up no matter what. The LA, bro, I'm going to beat. I'm going to beat. <laughs> <laughs> they booed us. And I meet students all the time. They not getting booed. I was in uh, Miami, Florida, a young girl, a Hispanic girl, really pretty Hispanic girl. I think she was uh, from Dominican, actually. And she uh, came up to me and she was all excited and then she just started crying. And I looked in the eyes, I said, why are you crying like that? She looked me in the eyes and she simply said, because you asked me about my daddy. She said, my daddy, he doesn't call, he doesn't write, he doesn't visit. And then she said this, he treats me like I'm not even his daughter. Ooh, you ain't mine. And I understood that pain. So I looked in the eyes and I said, don't get bitter. I said, forgive him. Forgiveness doesn't make him right. It's just going to make you free. And then I said something to her. I whispered her in the ear and I said, because you didn't really come from your dad. You only came through your dad. I said, you came from God. You one of a kind. And then I gave her two words. Everybody say second half. Second half. Can I be real with you? There's a reason I'm sharing this. Share a little bit of my background. I'm sharing this story for a reason. Simply at that halftime, we walked into that locker room and our coach looked us in the eyes and he said, guys, I don't care about the score, though we have zero. For some of our families, we feel like that. I know my mama did. He said, and I don't care about the crowd that's booing us. He said, but I know you got what it takes. And for every mother here who's struggling, and maybe your son or daughter is going astray, listen to me. He said, we just going to get a new game plan for the second half. And they begin to change the entire game plan. We worked six days on one plan. Now, in 10 minutes, they changed everything. Case in point, Dr. Ed Cole looked me in the eyes. He said, Keith, change is not change until it's changed. We've thought about it, met about it, prayed about it, hoped about it. But you know, we stepped back out on that field with a whole new mindset, new game plan. We're going to come back, come back, come back, come back. And in the last minutes of the game, the clock goes tick, tick. Tick, and we three points down and running down the edge of that sideline on the Coliseum. One inch from the out of bounds, corner in zone. This is for the game. My buddy Eric, who left USC to go to the Green Bay Packers, the guys, all of them, it's for the game. The ball is coming. He's running with everything he has, and he just reaches. For my mothers and my fathers, just keep reaching. Come on. For my young people, keep reaching for your dream. And he didn't catch it at first. He tips it, but then he gets the other hand and pulls it in and gets hit. Boom! And everybody in the stadium erupts because they don't know, did he catch it, did he not, was he in, was he out? But the man with the striped shirt just stood up in the corner with both hands, touched it. I flew all the way from New York to L.A. today to say this, not to share a football story with you. 
to share with you that we did not win that game the first half. We won that game the second, second half. half. Come on, parents. We won that game the second half. half. One more time. We won that game the second half. half. And many of us in this room, including myself and Clarence, have had some bad first halves. But you are here today because we are as a team. That's why we had those jerseys on because it's about teamwork where we're getting some new game plans to help our children, our lives, our families, our future, so that we can all have a great second, second half. half. I looked my mom in the eyes and said, Mom, I want to go to college. <coughs> no one in my family had ever been. That's the farthest thing from my thinking. You living in these raggedy apartments in this neighborhood, and I said, Mom, I want to go to college. I got a new game plan for my fellas, man. I went from the back of the classroom to the front. In the morning, they had the blunts in the 40s, but all of a sudden, I had a new game plan. And guess what? Second half. My grades just a little bit more, and a little bit more. It wasn't easy. A little bit more pushing, and a little bit more. And all of a sudden, I found myself in UBC. I didn't know it was that valuable where, you know, we got these movie stars bribing a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and four years later, I was standing on a stage. Thousands of people were clapping. And they said, tonight we present our top NCAA award. They only give it out once every year on UNC. It's called the Howard Jones Award. It's the one award given to the, they said, tonight we present the Howard Jones Award given to the one player with the highest overall grade point average. Academic All-American nominee, Scholar Award of Honor. They said, tonight our winner is Mr. Keith Davis. And I walked up with my suit and tie and put it in my hands. And I was making a speech. All these people had tuxedos on and cameras on me, but I couldn't finish the speech. Because I didn't see a thousand people. I saw one lady in the front row, my mama. But by the way, she was looking beautiful. She had no more alcohol. No more drugs, no more crazy boyfriend. You know why? My mama was living. And she had tears in her eyes and she was making noise that only my mama and my grandmama said ought to make when you're proud of your kids. <laughs> because her son was on his stage. Second. So I hold this up like this, because we know in LA, you know how to do some gang signs with those fingers. But there's only one sign that matters. Everybody hold up two fingers like this. Everyone say second half. Second half. Second half. Time, second half. Second half. Second half. I want to challenge you today for my moms. There was one word that kept my mother going. And I'll share it with you because my mom recently passed away of a disease called cancer. I got the phone call from my brother, Keith, mom is sick. I flew all the way back to LA, straight off LAX, straight to the hospital, no food, no nothing. I run to this hospital room, and the kind of cancer she had, it come so fast, it took over her body so fast, and then she ended up having a stroke, so she couldn't talk. So by the time I got there, which was less than a day, she couldn't even speak. So I grabbed my mother's by the hand and I said, Mama, if you can hear me, move your hand. And she moves her hand. And day and night, she moves her hand. And then one day we walk in that room, my brother and I, and hand is not moving. Mom is gone. Tears are rushing down my face. But my uncle touches me and he says, Keith, he says, don't you dare be sad. He said, because I talk to your mom every day and she was so proud of you. This is a challenge for my young ones here and I had a chance to share with him. I'm glad her last thoughts of me wasn't walking down the street throwing up that sign that all my cousins had thrown up. I'm glad her last thoughts of me on her deathbed wasn't of me firing up a blunt, man. I'm glad her last thoughts of me wasn't opening my report card and it said, D, he could be great, but he never tried. No. Second half. And for my mom's here, she was so proud. She got hold of something called vision. 
and she imparted it to me. And that's why I did the thing with the dreams. The word vision is a very powerful word. I don't want to get into the details of it, but can I explain this real quick? <clears throat> the word vision comes from the Greek word, op, uh, the Greek word for vision or dream is called optica, which is where we get the word for an eye doctor. It's called an optometrist. And actually those from Mexico understand I was in Mexico City and all the eyeglass places I saw I just said optica, 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 optica. So we understand that's from the Greek derivative of the word vision. The word vision simply means something in the distance is not here yet, but I can see it. And it actually, in essence, it means, it actually means optica, it means coming into view. It's not here, but it's coming into view. Can I explain this? There's a blind lady in history, very famous lady, Helen Keller. She was blind and deaf, and they asked her a very powerful question. She was completely blind. They said, what can be worse than being completely blind? And her response was so powerful. She said, the only thing worse than being completely blind is having sight, but no vision. You know why? Sight can only see what is, but vision sees what could be. Sight is a function of the eyes, but vision is a function of the heart. That means you keep seeing it even when your eyes are closed. So my mama saw it even when her son was at the bottom of the cliffs. My mama saw it even in these raggedy apartments. She saw it even when her son was getting pulled away by this gang and that way. She saw something better for him coming into view. Can I be real with you today? I don't live by what my eyes see. I live by what my heart believes. And for my parents, keep believing something great for your children. It's coming into view. Everybody say vision. Vision. I challenge you today, your greatest gift is not sight, it's vision. That marriage, that child, it ain't here yet, and they don't know why you're still praying, you're still hoping, you're still believing, because you can see it coming into view. There's a change. Funny story, and I'll let Clarence come up. I was 10 years old. We were living over some part of LA, because we kept moving. I ran to my mama one day and I said, Mama, please let me play football. Please, Mama, please. The problem was, when I was 10 years old, I didn't look like this. I used to be a real short, fat, chubby little kid. No joke. I had a big old belly. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> So my mama took me down to the park and she signed me up. My first coach walked out. His name was Coach Rudy. I would never in my life be Coach Rudy. Coach Rudy was big. He was mean. He would, he would scream at the kids, give me some laps. And so all the kids would take off running, but I was so chubby that I couldn't keep up with all the kids, so I would be way in the back just. <laughs> I could not do the sit-ups. I could not do the push-ups. My arms were locked all the way out, and my belly was still touching the ground. I was so tired. All my mom said, tired. tired. I was so tired. It was the first day. I went home that night. I went into a raggedy little apartment. I looked my mama in the eyes, and I'll never forget, she talked about this to the day she died. I said, Mama, I don't want to play football no more. <laughs> 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 he too hard. He too mean. And everybody laughing at me. And my mama was going through it. You know, with her addictions, with her boyfriend, this and that. She, she, I was just waiting. She, always, she really didn't care about a lot of stuff. She didn't come to the game, right? So I just wait for her to put her arm around me and say, that's okay, baby, you can quit. Let me get a little hug, right? But for some reason she didn't. She stopped. She looked me in the eyes and she said the one thing that changed the rest of my life. Talk about vision. My mama looked me in the eyes and she said, boy, them people got my $50. You better get your <laughs> Quit. Come on, winners never. Quit. Everybody say second half. Second half. Everybody say breakthrough. Breakthrough. Come on, breakthrough. Breakthrough. For my parents, come on. You can't quit. No matter how tired it is, listen. My young people, you can't quit. It's coming through. Listen, I'm saying breakthrough for me. So what's going to happen is uh, my friend Clarence is going to come up and share. And we're going to talk a little bit about a breakthrough for a second. And, uh, because <laughs> what we need in our city and our nation and my heart is reaching out for LA for every family, every parent, every young person 
They may have counted you out, but they don't know it's your time for a break. Let's give it up for my friend Clarence Lee. Before I talk about this, I'm going to keep it real with you. I've known Keith for a long, long time.